All right, welcome back everyone. As uh, Peter said, I'm Sharon Sherling. You might see on your program that um, the moderator of the session was supposed to be Abby Cordova, who is a visiting fellow at the Kellogg Institute this semester, um, and who is from El Salvador, and I'm sure would do a much better job than I in moderating this session. However, Abby unfortunately went back to the University of Kentucky for spring break, where she is currently based and uh, had an illness and I was not able to make it back today to join us. So I'm subbing for her, but happy to be here. As I was telling Laura, um, my job is not to attend conferences. Um, and so I'm actually happy to have an excuse to be able to attend at least part of this one. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our first speaker. I'm going to introduce our first, first speaker, let him speak, then I'll introduce our second speaker, let her speak, and then we'll do Q&A. Our first speaker is Father Mauricio Gabri. He is the chair of the Department of Psychology and also director of the graduate program in social intervention at UCA in El Salvador. He studies gender, social and gang violence, psychosocial intervention and political violence, disasters and undocumented child migration to the United States. Um, he holds a PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan. Both of our speakers are University of Michigan. Hmm. Um, and he has served as a consultant on irregular migration for the United Nations and the International Organization for On Migration. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Father Mauricio, who's going to use the microphone because he's having a little bit of an issue with his throat. Good afternoon. I hope I can, uh, you can hear me. I have a, a funny voice. Every presentation has certain remarks before the beginning of the presentation. The first one I just did, I'm a phonic. My father was a mathematician and a lawyer. And he told me 22 minutes is 22 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and there might be a standard deviation which would only uh, pertain to the kindness of the people who are listening to you. The second thing is that I'm a social psychologist. And from, from that perspective, I'm going to approach the issue of social psych of, of, of um, violence against women more structurally, more than clinical. Thirdly, uh, I'm going to look at different forms of violence that women uh, endure, uh, bo both at home and both in the migration process as well as in the relocation process well they they are in the united states can you listen can you hear me yes, yes. okay uh, and thirdly if i if i uh, i hope that the presentations there will be some repetition which is good because it will make us think and uh, reflect a bit and hopefully that may bring some um, some different type of uh, revisited, uh, controversial, uh, different points of view. And fourthly and last, fifthly and lastly, my father used to say to me, if you keep your 22 minutes, you will draw a smile from someone. <laughs> Violence against women has to be understood within the context of the country and the context in which it happens. We happen to, we happen to uh, um, talk about violence against women in El Salvador. And let me give you the first statistics. Miguel Cruz uh, presented this view, uh, this uh, graph, but what, what it does, this graph presents is uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, and Costa Rica all together. As you can see, the red line is El Salvador, which is the highest line. 
2003 is the mano dura that uh, President Flores instituted. What you can see is a completely reversal of the boomerang effect. Instead of diminishing the amounts of murder rates, uh, what, you, what you see is an increase in murder rates. Uh, funny enough, the President Flores had asked for 18 months uh, permission to use the military, which is not used to, is not used by constitution to uh, issues of national, uh, of national security. And the day it expired, the National Assembly declared it unconstitutional. And then formally, and afterwards, President Saka instituted uh, the mano super mano dura, which produced exactly the same result. Uh, we are not the only ones. I think they say that men and women are the only ones that fall in the same hole all the time. Uh, what you can see is that the, the, the majority of the uh, of, of the countries act pretty much the same. If you look at El Salvador between 1999 and 1903, you might even discover a minor a minor slope, a negative slope. That's because uh, criminal uh, assassinations and accidents were all lumped together. Once it started separating, uh, the, the situation uh, changes. Um, El Salvador has to do with, has the highest, has the highest murder rate in the whole hemisphere. Uh, and it, within that context is when we talk about uh, violence against women. Worldwide, if you see the red line, I mean the green lines, uh, you find the, the, the highest murder rates of women are worldwide, in which you, you will encounter uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras four of the countries. That is, we constitute the, the most uh, <clears throat> egregious, as, as it to be, uh, uh, case of the highest murder rates of, of women. Why is the case? Here are the cases. Some, some are, are in Spanish. I wrote, I wrote in Spanish, some I wrote in Spanish. These are cases of feminicides in El Salvador. As you can see in this blue uh, histograms, but you, up, on, up until 1904, you see a slightly increase. Then there is a, a slight increase. And then during the 1990s and 1911, uh, you find an increase only to level off to 481 this past uh, a couple of years ago in uh, homicide rates. It has to do, I think, one, one of the reasons has to do with some of the uh, things that have, that have been already uh, <coughs> into in this, in this particular case. As women occupy upper echelons of the command of drugs, then they become much more prone to being assassinated. Secondly, as women become, because of poverty, uh, obligated to support the family by selling and peddling drugs, then they, the, the, if what you find is more dismemberments, more killing of women. Uh, the, Perhaps the, the, the most important aspect of why there's more women killed is the 
the belief, an ingrained belief, not only in El Salvador, but it's in a lot of Latin, Latin American countries, that women are the possession of men. And if, if, you, if I possess you, I possess something, I can dispose of it the way I wish. Uh, here you have the highest, the, the femicides over, over, over all homicides in the country. But you can see that El Salvador is the highest, 12%, 14%, depending on how you count, uh, since 1910, uh, has the highest rate of homicides per 100,000 women in the world. That is to say, uh, we have a very, very, very complicated situation, which the situation uh, with the narco traffic and the lack of lack judiciary, uh, judiciary uh, process uh, is not. Let me give you an example. I was directing a thesis and this woman was killed. She was, she was killed by 12 bullets and three machete, and three machete wounds. And the judge, a woman said, this was the, the, the not qualify as a woman because none of her genital parts had been touched. Uh, so we had, we had uh, a problem of judicial formation that considers homicides, femicides. Uh, here you have the femicides in El Salvador per 100,000 rights of women since 111, 2011 to 2016. There is a dip in 2013 to 14, and again, it's beginning to, to rise. What kinds of form, according to STEM or the Instituto Salvadoreño de, de, de la Mujer, the different forms of violence against women. Uh, you have violent deaths, as you can see from 205 to 116, uh, the number typically tends to increase. Sexual violence, uh, that typically tends to increase, and I think my colleague might my address the issue of partner, partner, partner violence. And you have physical violence uh, and other forms of violence. In total, uh, in demo, since the last three years, has counted 20,880 cases of women, violence against women. Now, that is not surprising, uh, as shocking as it may be, the surprising, the surprising is that there is basically no investigation. And what you find, the cases and rates of violent deaths according to sex. If you look at 1915, 1916, 1917, the number of cases, the number of women, you, you, can, you can very clearly see that uh, obviously more men more men uh, are victims of violence, but the number of women, uh, the, 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 rates can, the rates increase. The, the violent uh, deaths of women that reach the criminal court system. In order, in order to, to convict someone for femicide, you have to have an investigation and most investigations are not done. In 2012, for, for well, 213, for example, of the violent deaths of women, which were 218, only 17 of those 218 were investigated. Uh, and that represents uh, only 7% of those that reach the public hearing and so on and so forth. That is to say, as time goes by, between 1212 12 and 1214, the not only the number of cases of women being assassinated, the cases are not investigated and the rates 
are very, very low, that they go to public hearing. From 7.8 in 13 uh, to 1.1. Uh, so the cases that, were, that, that will end in a, woman, a person being convicted for, for femicide is very, 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 very low on account of, of two things, on account of judicial uh, um, misunderstanding of a, of a death, it's a death, if it's a woman, it's a woman, it's a man, it's a man, uh, and the fact that there is very little, uh, very, very little uh, uh, investigation. Let, let me took uh, let me look at uh, I took this uh, this uh, thing from the uh, from the women, children, and women that have been deported from Mexico and the United States. At the lower left hand corner, you have that sixty percent of all women deported from the United States is are, are women and only 39% are adolescents. The interesting thing about this graph is not that so much as appalling as it may be, but the fact that the reasons they are used when, when a person is deported back to United, back to El Salvador, they, they are interviewed and they are asked the reasons why they left. 62.3% uh, represent uh, or, or say that they did it for economic reasons. That is not uh, surprising because an adolescent, for example, of a 16 year older will not abuse that as a reason why by uh, they are leaving the country. What's interesting is the next category, category over that is 30% of all adolescent uh, women uh, say that the reason they left the country in a regular manner is because of sexual violence. And the rest, uh, uh, I can't see. The, oh. Uh, the, it is obvious, uh, family reunification uh, more is, is very comparable, but more children want to be with their parents. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a very, very, very complex uh, issue, which re requires further research. A parent who leaves a, who, who leaves a, a child in the United States, leaves a child, let's say, six months old, one, one year old, leaves the country with the expectation of coming back. With no expectations, they don't realize. And after six or seven years, they find another partner. They find they have another, 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 another brother or sister whom they do not know. Mother becomes a voice not a relationship, mother becomes a, a gift, not, uh, not something that you confide in. And as a consequence, uh, uh, parents that return momentarily, those that have TPS, for example, or the temporary permanent, permanent stay in the, in the United States, uh, or, or persons that return back, deported to the United States, have a lot of violence in the country, in, in, I'm sorry, in the city, in, in the, in the, um, in, in, in the house, because they did not recognize, the child does not recognize his sibling or sibling as such. And there are uh, rivalries. Uh, so that's, that's the most important issue. Uh, a woman, uh, a 16 year old woman from, that was, we interviewed in Tapachula, who uh, was kidnapped by, 
by the Celtas in, uh, in Tamaulipas, was raped repeatedly by gangs. His mother eventually died. She, she eventually, she eventually uh, uh, escaped. And she told us, what reason is there for me to live? I've lost everything. I love, I lost my dignity. I love, I lost everything. And the government have very, has very little, very little programs that will address the issue of uh, psychosocial intervention for victims of violence, of sexual violence, especially in the, on the, on the, um, on the migration route. What are the traumatic experiences that, that are the women experience in irregular migration? And I divided this into two columns, pre-migration trauma and migration route trauma. And the pre-migration trauma is a threat to their children and family members by gangs. It is quite often that the families are threatened by gangs because of the act of, of, of children. In fact, one, one, one group of twins who interviewed in Tapachula, in Mexico, I, and the, the, the gangs knew the kids were, were part of the, uh, had been captured because uh, the gangs typically migrate, as, uh, as, as the fellow said, they, they follow the same pattern, but they also find the pattern to follow people. <coughs> and so they gave false information in migration offices. And so they say, so that, that, mean, that means that they will stay for four or four, 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 five years and four days. And as a consequence, they can inform very quickly who is there and who is not there. Uh, child abuse and intimate partner <laughs> violence is typically one, one cause of pre-migration trauma. That is, women leave because they cannot support it anymore. Children are, uh, I'm not leaving my, my, my husband because of my, my child. It's no longer worth the, the, the abuse, the humiliation, the, uh, the injuries. Uh, are, are, are too much. Another one is domestic, domestic sexual abuse and domestic violence. Interviewing, interviewing men who are married, they find it strange that the concept of, of, uh, of sexual abuse or violation occurs. She's my wife. No, there's no violation possible. Uh, Drug-related gang violence in their communities, they can, no lo they can no longer live peacefully in their, in their, con in their communities because of drug-related activities, which includes threats, uh, uh, which includes uh, mm, the, the selling of drugs, which includes murders, which includes guns, they cannot sleep at night, et cetera, et cetera. And poverty is one another area. And uh, poverty in El Salvador, 40.65% 40, 60, 40. of the people live under, 20, <coughs> under, under $2 a day. The caravans that you've heard uh, leaving in, quote unquote, spontaneously, <coughs> it's because these people never, never considered migrating. They didn't have the, the, the money, but with the support of other people, they, they ventured out to uh, being able to, to, uh, to migrate. They have nothing the time they leave with 10, $15 in their pocket uh, and their children I interviewed a man, he had a baby, 
with four bottles of milk and tea in in San Salvador, he was going to leave, and he was going to get to Mexico, to to the United States, in four bottles of water, uh, milk. Uh, the poverty is extreme for for especially for some people. Now, migration route trauma, kidnappings and threats, that is very very common. Kidnappings and threats and violations. Uh, uh, Physical abuse and rape, threats to be and threats to be rape, extortions, and the uh, the federal police, especially in New Mexico, is notorious for extorting uh, uh, migrants. Not only do they do they extort uh, the the organized crime extort migrants, but the the, the the, the migration authorities always also extort violence. Uh, we met a group of people, 30, they were asking for $30,000. In four days, they were able to gather $30,000 only to be uh, called to the next sta station for another $30. They, they, uh, this is, a, this is part of the trauma. Life environmental uh, conditions in extreme, uh, in extreme conditions, lack of water, lack of food, fear, uh, in, in, the, in the routes, each ever more, more dangerous. Physical assault. Physical assault, not only of, of passengers, of fellow fellow migrants, but especially of the coyotes, abandonment in abandonment in in, uh, in dangerous places. Uh, people are abandoned. They cannot they cannot walk anymore. They just simply leave them there to die on their own. Uh, being held captive that's very very common. Uh, up to we've documented up to thirty days. 30 something days being captive in Reynosa in Mexico, waiting for the time to, uh, to transfer to, to the United States. In, in, the, in the process, they serve as sexual slaves. They serve as, as other types of, of working uh, uh, activities. And then they witnessing a horrific, uh, a horrific uh, acts. Being able to see someone being killed or someone being thrown out of the, of the of, of a train or being able to see someone being raped uh, for many, for many, many women is, is very difficult to overcome. Uh, it's, called, it's, called, it's called secondary tra traumatization. Uh, now, Trauma of refugees, undocumented immigrants, women, post-migration uh, post trauma. That is, once they transfer all this, then they live in the States and they have two different types of trauma. One which I called structural stressors and one which I call situational stressors. Poverty is the first one. How are they gonna feed themselves or feed their children. Uh, language barriers, they don't know how to communicate, they don't know how to, where to go, they don't know, they don't know, they don't have the skills even to, uh, even to, to ask for a job, uh, difficulty obtaining employment, uh, illegal person tag, the communities where they live often, uh, tag them as illegal and as a consequence of uh, 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 what can I call it? Uh, discrimination, racism, racism if you're black, if you're Latino, if the skin of the skull does not match the skin of the skull in the neighborhood, 
they have difficulty. Family separation. And this is, uh, I've talked to many, many women back in El Salvador uh, who, who decided to return is family separation, not, not seeing their loved ones. And none, we cannot see our loved ones, but we have the ability to do that, the possibility to do that. They cannot, they cannot see the loved ones. And they relate to their children who've, who's five, they relate, uh, who's now, I'm sorry, who's 15, they relate to, to the person as, a, as, a, as if the person was five. And so the, uh, the family separation for years or they can never, they, they never will see their, their family again. Can remember bad locks in processing immigration cases. Years after years, four, five, six years without being able to, to get a close to their case. You know, something terrible may happen, but if you put some, if you put closure to it, you may be able to begin to, uh, to, uh, to <clears throat> arrive at a modicum of, uh, of, of uh, mental health institutional betrayal trauma. They tell you they one thing, and then when you come in, they tell you another thing. They tell you, all you, all, all you have to do is do this, and then the, the next moment they're in jail. Or it's gonna cost you this, or then it's gonna cost you more than that. Uh, situational stressors were the procession of the uh, perception of discrimination, worries about about family, about family welfare. Are their family doing well? Are they using their money, their hard-earned money well? Uh, what about so and so? What about so and so? Uh, affiliations. Uh, perception of anti-immigration climate, a limited social support they have in their place of. Uh, where they live, they have very limited social support unless they live in a place where you, you have uh, locals of the same place. And I, I don't mean locals by saying from Chalatenango. They have to be from La Flores, they have to be from La Arcatao, they have to be from this and this and the other. They have to be from specific places. Uh, house overcrowding, as you know, Many of them have to uh, work several shifts and they turn shifts, sleeping on the same and a very small little, and a small little uh, area, uh, not enough, and only to get up early in the morning uh, to, uh, to, to go to the second or third shift. Seasonal work and unemployment, uh, especially in the Northeast, uh, work may be plentiful at one time and then it stops. And then what do they do with that they call los biles. Now, the other bills that come in, uh, the rent, the, uh, the, uh, the air conditioning, the telephone, the uh, uh, heating and so on and forth. And domestic violence from relatives. Uh, some women relate that before, uh, before they had a very good relationship with their with their typically hu uh, husbands or their t or their uncles. Now they live together in the states. The relationship transforms, and they and they are the the victims of uh, of, uh, of, of of trauma. The traditional uh, form of understanding trauma is that is uh, an experience that involves actual or threatened death of injury of, or, or witnessing such events. Uh, typically in clinical psychology, they call it PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. I would like to, uh, and the causes are prolonged exposure, history of physical or sexual abuse, high levels of stress, a history of depression and anxiety and other mental illness, substance abuse, 
experienced previous traumatic events, um, extent uncontrollable, inescapable, or unexpected types of, uh, of traumatic events, uh, rape, sexual abuse, intentional human inflicted fa failure. Uh, but all this depends on the stress in event and the personal characteristics of the individual. If you're small, if you're, if, if you're, if you're uh, personality characteristics. One thing, if, 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 you don't, uh, if you don't get anything out of this except that I am hoarse, is that trauma is not a disorder. Symptoms, the symptoms that people report are normal responses to extraordinary acts of aggression and intent of arriving at homeostasis. So these are the intents of people that are arriving at homeostasis. The, the reaction is not the, the, the problem, the problem is the situation. Uh, many victims, uh, this is, this, it, it, it befuddles us to find that proportionally many victims overcome it in a spontaneous way, traumatic experiences. So long psychiatrists, because uh, many times uh, the, uh, the situation uh, ex uh, looks, uh, is overcome by us in a way. And these are the types of symptoms. How much time do I have? We're almost out of time. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the type of symptoms, typically uh, uh, avoidance, intrusive memories, changes, emotional reactions, and negative thinking of thought. Martin Barreau says that uh, one of the judges that assassinated in the United States, that it is not the, the problem with PTSD is that it places the, the blame in the effort to the individual and not to the structure and the society. It's structure and society that has to change and aid the individual to acquire a, 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 a strong, uh, a, a strong, sense of mental health. So uh, we'll skip this part because uh, what I'm looking to, I'm talking about is the focus of the individual and ignorance of the social and political forces that contribute to personal and social distress. Those are the things that have to be looked at. The viewpoint of an, uh, the, the the problem with, uh, with PTSD is that it looks at the person as a, a, histor a, a historical person and centers on the harm individual without attending damage to the culture. Two things are done, at least. Damage to the individual and damage to culture. And therefore, both have to be, both have to be repaired. The individual neglects to identify the vulnerability that is social forces that contribute to stressful situations. And I think that little little thingy was my 22 seconds. Minute. <laughs> and so I will uh, stop here. Uh, we can talk about it later. Uh, Martin Baro has a uh, uh, scathing uh, critique of PTSD. I published on PTSD, but a long time ago. Uh, and I uh, looked at psycho and psychosocial trauma because it is, the trauma is both within the individual caused by the situation outside. Thank you very much. your questions for Father Mauricio until after Laura's presentation. Um, our next speaker is Laura Miller Graff, who is an assistant professor of psychology and peace studies here at the Notre University of Notre Dame, where 
She is a core faculty member in the Kropp Institute for International Peace Studies and a faculty fellow of the Kellogg Institute as well. Uh, Laura's areas of expertise include childhood exposure to violence, intimate partner violence, psychosocial care, treatment evaluation, post-traumatic stress, and resilience. Her current projects focus on intergenerational effects of violence against women and individual and family-based psychosocial support programs for adolescents and young adults exposed to chronic socio-political conflict. As I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. she also holds a PhD from the University of Michigan. Laura? Well, many thanks to all of you for having me here, and thank you, Father Mauricio, for your great uh, presentation. I will kind of be scoping out um, to some big, big picture type questions. Um, I am not an expert in the El Salvadorian context at all, but I'll be speaking a lot about partner violence more broadly. Um, and some of the kind of types of questions that we need to ask um, when we're thinking about <coughs> intervention and supports across contexts um, to give us kind of a framework. Okay, um, I want to talk uh, first just about some distinction in terms. Um, so gender-based violence is a term that is very prominent um, in international discourses right now. Um, and it refers specifically to acts of violence that are directed towards inter individuals because of their gender. Um, so this does not only refer to violence against women, although violence against women and girls is certainly the most common type um, of gender-based violence. So that is what I will be focusing on um, for the most part today, but I want to give us kind of that broader, broader picture first. Um, types of gender-based violence are diverse, and they include intimate partner violence, which refers to violence between um, intimate couples, married or unmarried, um, sexual abuse and coercion by non-intimate partners, trafficking, forced, ex uh, forced prostitution, exploitation of labor, debt bondage, um, physical and sexual violence against prostitutes, uh, which is extremely common but often overlooked. Um, and things like sex selective abortion, female infanticide, um, and the deliberate neglect of um, female girls or for, of female children. Um, with varying uh, prevalences across context, you also have things like rape in the context of war, um, female genital mutilation, and honor killings, um, in addition to uh, some types. So this is a, a helpful organization, or at least I find it thinking about um, violence against women in particular um, by perpetrator. So one of the things that is really important to recognize um, in the work on violence against women is that the vast majority of violence perpetrated against women is perpetrated by known entities and by close entities. So there tends to be kind of this framing that we're thinking about, you know, women being assaulted by strangers out of the blue on the street. And while certainly that does happen, that doesn't really explain the majority of um, violence against women. So you see here a number of different, oops, it up, so it's maybe a little bit there we go. Um, a number, number of different types of violence that can be perpetrated by partners specifically. Um, some a broader range by family members, and then some that are perpetrated by other individuals, sometimes known, sometimes unknown to the <coughs> Okay, when we think about theoretical models for understanding um, the effects of violence against women, there are a few different things that we can use to help us frame that question. Um, so first, if we think about um, women, and I have here women as parents because I'm going to talk about intergenerational effects specifically, 
um, we think about the individual as this combination of different individual factors, right? Biological, psychological, social, um, that comprise kind of a mm -hmm. network of internal effects, right? So we see that violence against women can have diverse effects within the individual, but that individual, as Father Maurizio pointed out, um, is nested within a series of systems, right? So if we think about it from a social ecological framework, we have women who are living with and interacting with family systems, neighborhood systems, and of course, broader cultural systems as well, right? And all of the dynamic interactions between the individual internal processes and those external systemic processes produce different kinds of effects, right? Against contact, across contexts, and certainly across individuals within those contexts. So we see lots of heterogeneity, right, and outcomes. Um, and in effects of violence against women for that reason. And if we think of this intergenerationally, right, for women who are also mothers, um, we have a strong kind of maternal tie um, to their child who is also, right, their individual being nested within their social context of which their mother is also a part. Um, and we have this dynamic interaction across generations, right, between, in this case, parent and child. Right, so how violence affects women um, can affect right, the manifestation of violence against children and children's experience of the after effects of violence against women. And that's mediated through a number of processes. Right? So we can think about ways in which that might be true. Um, parenting processes, family functioning, um, co-regulation between mothers and children. So uh, one really particularly interesting piece of research in this um, area is that infants, when they are first born, um, are completely dependent on their parents to learn emotion regulation skills. They learn them by observing their parent, um, by physiologically and observationally, right, behaviorally, um, cope with stress. And so infants' earliest stress regulation responses are very much formed by how mothers cope with stress. Um, and so we see these pathways emerging really, really early in the lifespan. Um, and of course, as I said, right, all of these dyads and family systems are nested within cultures that have particular uh, manifestations of violence against women and a number of different considerations that need to be made when we're thinking about um, <coughs> uh, intervening. And then all of these things, right, are unfolding across the historical context where we have any number of different changes, right, <coughs> at the individual level in that people develop over time, right, so how um, adverse events affect you um, is different across the lifespan, right? How a child would react to an act of violence is different than how a 50-year-old, 60-year-old would react to an act of violence. Um, and across history, right? We have all things contextually that change across history, laws change, social systems change, people move, um, and all of those, again, affect our perspective. Okay. I'm going to show you um, a little bit of research that gives us some insight into um, some intergenerational processes. This is a project that some colleagues and I worked on that looks at um, the multi-systemic effects of um, different types of risk and protective factors for women who have a history of victimization um, and how those um, protective factors for women indirectly affect their children. So um this is not showing up very well okay but on the left side um you have um women's history of victimization their family satisfaction and functioning and the quality of their neighborhood so for all of these scales high is good so high neighborhood quality is better right low on these scales represents some level of risk so for mothers right who had a history of victimization we see higher rates of depression um, not surprising, right? There's plenty of literature to support this. Um, and we see that family satisfaction and neighborhood quality um, are serving as systemic risk and protective factors for those women and for those women's mental health in the aftermath of victimization, right? So for women who have stronger families, um, who are more highly functioning and who are coming from um, better neighborhoods um, in terms of the quality, things like social cohesion, um, disorganization, we see that they have lower rates of depression, right? Um, and then for those mothers, 
we see that their children um, are doing better in terms of their psychological health over time. This is at age four and age six. So we see some very clear downstream effects, right? For both women's victimization, but also the social protective factors at play um, in the broader context. Okay. Um, I'm gonna focus in a little bit on intimate partner violence specifically. Um, both because this is my primary area of, area, area of work within the context of violence against women, but also the most common type of violence against women. Um, so intimate partner violence includes physical violence, sexual violence and coercion, psychological and emotional abuse, stalking, course of control of partners, and economic abuse. Um, and the particular constellation of what is assessed and how different types of violence are conceptualized um, does vary across contexts. So you'll see it being um, understood differently in different places. Um, the global prevalence of IPV uh, for women is about 30%. Typically, um, this is from DHS surveys, um, Typically, this only includes um, the assessment of physical and sexual violence. So we can think about that as like a bare minimum type estimate of the rates of violence against women. Um, and at the national level, um, surveys in El Salvador place it at about one in four, um, which is, I would say, kind of a difficulty, pretty close to the average. But again, this is only physical and sexual forms of violence, the DHS survey. Um, module includes about six questions, so uh, pretty bare bones. Um, of women um, in El Salvador who report psychological violence, 90% of those also report uh, physical abuse. So we see a really, really high overlap um, in El Salvador in particular between psychological violence um, and physical abuse. Okay. Um, thinking about consequences of partner violence, we see that there are a broad range of consequences for women. So we see higher rates of um, distress, um, not surprisingly, um, and higher reports of personal insecurity um, and lower levels of social support. So one of the features or factors that we see in um, how IPV manifests across contexts is that women are socially isolated by partners. Um, and this is, can be one of the most damaging effects of partner violence, right? Because not only are women experiencing direct violence, right, against their bodies, but they are also being, at the same time, pulled out and pulled away from all of the networks that can provide them support um, in um, exiting and coping with that. We also see that women um, who have experienced partner violence have higher rates of unintended pregnancy, and they have higher rates of mortality um, in labor and deliver delivery as do their infants, um, and more labor complications. <coughs> um, women over the lifespan who have a history of violence also have um, more uh, physical health problems over time. Um, and so we see, right, when we think again about that person is really a diverse bubble of psychological, social, physical characteristics, partner violence is really affecting women very holistically, right? Um, so this um, particular study um, <laughs> looks at partner violence in pregnancy. Um, and one kind of misnomer psychologically in our psychological history was that um, children um, or it used to be believed that children um, were relatively unaffected by trauma that they didn't witness or that they witnessed early in childhood because they were too young to understand it, right? Um, and we know, right, from research as it's progressive, this is pretty much completely false, right? And actually quite the opposite. So trauma in childhood is actually even more potent than experiencing trauma for the first time in adulthood. Um, but one of the things that we looked at um, recently was what about trauma that women experience that infants may have never even directly experienced, right? They never witnessed it even, right? So we looked at the effect of interpersonal violence during pregnancy against women and its downstream effects for toddlers. And what we found was, again, kind of mediated through this parent-child interactional process 
that violence during pregnancy had negative effects on toddler um, aggressive, what we would consider externalizing, like acting out behaviors, even if the violence was contained to the period of pregnancy, right? So that um, toddlers didn't necessarily ever witness it. Um, so we see, right, that addressing violence against women in all its forms at all its times um, is particularly important when we think about kind of intergenerational transmission. Um, and we need to think again about these process pathways. Um, and I will also add, by the way, that for partner violence, um, pregnancy is the time of highest incidence. So in women's life, uh, in lives, they are most likely um, to experience partner violence during pregnancy. Um, okay. Across context, there are a few um, maintaining factors. So I want to turn a little bit to um, some contextual and cultural considerations and questions that we might ask when we're thinking towards um, intervention. So across context, one phenomena that has been observed, uh, and this is an old kind of social psychological um, concept, is the idea of just moral beliefs. So this um, theory states that individuals have the need to believe that our world is just and fair. And we do a lot of work psychologically to get ourselves there, right? Um, to explain why bad things happen and why somehow they have happened to us or why we have been preserved from them, right? Um, and the, this you know, driving belief can result in a lot of different problems um, that are uh, in, in terms of our views of uh, victimization and victims of violence. So we see things like victim derogation. So I think these women um, were raped because of some personal character malformation, right? They were raped because they were loose. Or blaming victims on putting themselves in that particular situation, right? So if they hadn't been involved in drugs, then this bad thing against them wouldn't have happened, right? So again, it's kind of placing blame on the victim. You also see um, variation across context um, in kind of the surrounding, the wrapping paper, right, of these types of violence. Um, so marriage is one. Um, so different contexts, violence happens in different ways. Some contexts it's almost entirely confined um, to violence within marriages. Some contexts it largely happens outside of marital relationships. Um, but one big question, right, is does violence within marriage count, right? And as Father Mauricio pointed out, often there is a belief that, you know, sexual violence perpetrated against your spouse is not a problem, right? Because that's your spousal right, right? Um, and this varies, again, across context. Spousal rape, by the way, is illegal in El Salvador, but, um, but it's not everywhere. Um, and some um, contexts, right, have very different uh, parameters around what's culturally sanction sanctioned, right? So you see kind of different things being brought forward um, in the criminal justice system um, based on what people's beliefs are about what is acceptable. Um, and justice systems, right, have different levels of tolerance for types of behaviors. So one um, disappointing recent development, um, not in this context, but in others, Russia recently um, changed one of its laws to make domestic physical forms of partner violence acceptable as long as they're basically not too bad. Um, so, you know, it leaves it completely right in the hands of whoever it is that's making the judgment um, whether or not it passes the bar for something that is problematic. Um, some other considerations, I'm almost done, um, is the intersection um, with other types of violence in the social temporal system. So partner violence does not occur in a bubble. We see it very much related to other forms of socio-political socio violence, gang violence, refugee trauma, right? It's an interconnected type of violence, and we definitely need to understand it as such. Um, so in terms of gang violence, there are lots of considerations um, and maintaining factors specific um, to gangs and partner violence. Um, so things like gender roles and power dynamics within gangs, the relationship between gang involvement and IPD, um, and in particular, right, whether or not um, gangs confer 
simultaneously forms of risk and forms of protection for women. Um, and that is a really important factor in thinking through a safe exit, right, um, for violent relationships. And you, of course, see different levels of acceptability, right, of violence within um, and across gangs. Okay, some legal considerations, um, in particular to this context. El Salvador does have a law criminalizing domestic violence, including marital rape. Um, all of you will make more than I, but um, like many um, laws related to uh, violence against women, it is generally poorly enforced. Um, and once charges are filed, they can be pursued without the consent of the victim. So the victim does not need to be on board um, for a criminal prosecution. Um, restraining, orders, restraining orders are available, um, but a, an update to the law, um, to the original law, now permits mediation um, as kind of an outcome for uh, violence against women. So looking again in this context, um, women do disclose their experiences of partner violence, um, but at pretty low rates, especially to formal institutions. So you have about two thirds of women reporting that they have experienced violence to a friend or family member, much lower percentage of that um, disclosing to any kind of formal institution. So this isn't even necessarily a legal institution, right? This could be a church or something. Okay. There are lots of reasons that people decide not to disclose, including fears about what the disclosure will mean, real evaluations about what that disclosure means for their safety, um, and basically a belief that it will not work and they will not be heard. Um, and there's plenty of work with service providers to show um, that women's assessment of that is on point, right? Not all of the service providers that they work with um, or all of the legal resources that they have are safe um, and not all of them um, are competent to handle violence against women effectively. Okay. We're we should be wrapping up, but I'll do my 30 little late, seconds. So. I'll do my 30 second word on intervention. So when we think about intervention with perpetrators, there are two big takeaways. Um, one is that intervention with perpetrating adults largely is ineffective. Um, the, there is some movement on formal reports ratings, but when you look at actual like couples ratings of whether or not violence occurs, it doesn't appear to be moving the needle too much. Um, what is helpful is intervening with voice before the onset of violence. So it's much, much easier to prevent violence from ever being perpetrated than it is to rectify it once it has happened. For women, um, there's a lot more um, resources that have been shown to be effective. So there's lots of different approaches. Um, all of these necessarily, I will say, um, have to think about safety within context. So women are most likely to be killed when they are leaving a partner. Um, and so pushing women to leave violent situations before all of the structural supports are in place for them to do so safely is really problematic. And so that is kind of a main consideration for intervention with survivors. Okay. Great. Thank you. Move up here so that I don't ignore this side of the room when I call on people from this side of the room. I typically uh, don't see the ones behind me. Um, and actually, that is for you, Andre. Um, we've been tweaking you without microphones, but we won't make you do so to not injure your throat. So I'm going to ask that um, Peter has graciously said that we could go a little bit over time. Um, since we started a few minutes late, but we, we do have a limited amount of time for a Q&A. So I'd like to take a few questions at a time and then um, ask for responses and we'll go through as many rounds as we can um, and still adjourn in time to have a bit of a break before the next session, which absolutely needs to start on time. So um, do I have anyone who'd like to ask a question? I'll jump in and ask a question then. I was hoping for the opportunity to ask a question. 
Um, and I just would like to ask both of you as psychologists to reflect on something that we heard this morning in the first session, and that is um, humiliating a young man is very likely to lead to violence, whereas humiliating a young woman was more likely to lead to her acquiescing to being subjected to violence. And this was connected to women's association with gangs, um, where we were told that um, in many cases, gang violence was intimate partner violence. And so kind of connecting what the two of you have been saying to what we heard this morning, I just thought it would be nice to have you reflect a, a bit, maybe <coughs> more, if we could start with you and then we'll ask Padre Mauricio also to reflect on that. Yeah, um, it makes sense, um, unfortunately. I, I mean, I think a lot of times, particularly humiliation, when somebody is humiliated, particularly in the context of a relationship, right? It is related to often their failure to exhibit whatever the socially normed relevant behavior is for that particular context, right? So um, if there are you know, norm, gender norms at play for women that demand, right, in their kind of biggest manifestation that women kind of are playing this supportive, um, demurring role, right? Um, and men are expected to demonstrate, you know, strength, authority, right? You can see that that humiliation might result in kind of differential outcomes for men and women um, based on how they're understanding gender roles, right? Um, for example, so you can, you might see more extreme manifestations of what is ultimately just gen gender behavior, right? Um, related to the humiliation. I think that part of it has to do with the way we socialize women. It has to, we socialize women to, to acquiesce, not to say no. Uh, let me give you an example of a research that I did some time ago. When we were exploring uh, sexual behavior of young men, these are young men, 12 to 14, and women 12 to 14. <coughs> the more sexual encounters, real or fictitious, that the man has, the more better he is in, in our culture. The more sexual contact, real or fictitious, the woman has, there's a lot of work for it. And so uh, we, we tend to humiliate the women into accept the norm rather than uh, reject the norm. Uh, we tend to socialize women into accepting the situation as it is, not the situation as it could be. We tend to socialize women in ways in which uh, they suffer. Marcela Lagarde, a Mexican anthropologist, has a wonderful thesis in a couple of pages uh, that says that uh, we tend to we tend to ask women to accept the, what is their lot. Their lot is to serve, their lot is to provide, uh, their lot is to satisfy everybody else but herself. For example, uh, if a sick family uh, care and needs for 24 hour care, it's not the man, it's the woman that has to do it. Uh, if uh, 
the decoration of the house needs to be taken care of as the woman, not the man. Uh, if uh, the, the, the use of what I call osio, free time, the free time is a man's prerogative, not a woman's prerogative. Let me give an example from the <coughs> research. A man comes back to work, takes a shower, puts on some perfume, puts some new clothes, some clean clothes, and say, bye, I'll see you in the morning. But if a woman says that, uh, uh, something else happens. That is to say, we, we tend to socialize women into, into the norm that's established and to accept male dominance. What is more, what is better? Feelings or thinking? Thinking is more important as a man. <coughs> Feeling as a woman. Thank you both for these presentations, extremely informative and helpful in helping us think through some of these um, very important issues. Um, Laura, you mentioned that some of the interventions are most effective for perpetrators when we do it at a younger age. What are some of the challenges to those, what are some of the demographical challenges to some of those interventions? Because I imagine that uh, people in certain class dynamics may be capitulating to these large cultural structures and you know, thinking about shame from the first presentation earlier today, men feeling this sense of shame about not being able to live out some ideal, ideal of manhood. Um, and how are the interventions <coughs> crossing that nexus of, you know, the upper class version of manhood being an ideal versus the lower class version of manhood being, you know, somewhat wanting. So, is there a lot yeah. of tensions there? That's such an excellent question. Um, and there is not a lot of, at least within the psychological literature, it, that, that has pushed that question. And I, I agree with you that it's a really important one. One thing that makes the space, the prevention space, a little bit easier, I would say, than the intervention space related to that, is that a lot of prevention programs um, focus on developing um, right relationship, right? So because people haven't um, perpetrated violence yet, the orientation is, you know, how do we think about what a respectful, intimate relationship looks like? And there's a little bit more of a space for participant-driven, right, um, <clears throat> voice in what that looks like, right? Um, that can be flexible across context and class. And I think that is a helpful um, part of those frameworks. I think what is challenging in intervention and often largely does not work. Um, again, probably, you know, probably driven to questions about class and also cultural norms is a lot of intervention frameworks focus on kind of like reteaching gender norms, right? So like, what is, you know, where have you kind of gone awry and how you as a man treat women and what your beliefs about women are. Um, and even if you can get people to kind of self-report some attitude change on that, there doesn't tend to be a lot of consequent behavioral change. Um, and the mechanisms for why that is, I don't fully know. But yeah, that's a really excellent question. Yeah, just to add to what Lisa said, uh, training at a younger age in human rights is a very, very effective. That is, that we all have the same dignity, 
that we all are human persons. Uh, once you go past six grades and the grade, then you go to the boys and the girls and the girls. And uh, it's a behavior that, that one exhibits towards the other sex is different. So there's not much evidence, but one evidence is that training, <coughs> training um, in the human life. In a small little uh, uh, town called Wisisilapa, which is uh, uh, who are talking about the status of parenting. And the lady was saying, you know what the problem is? Son of malditos derechos humanos. <laughs> because they have human rights. Because now, I, before I used to do certain things, and now the kid goes to the judge of peace and puts him in jail. So uh, it has to do with, uh, at any rate, Tender, the better uh, to teach about uh, human rights. I, I have more comments than questions, just connecting to what you have been saying. Is I had an experience in, in one of the prisons where we worked many, many, many years ago. Um, it was a very tiny, tiny, this is as big as this room, you know, that was the prison. 30 women uh, were there. And one of the things that happened is that we did a, a session regarding um, violence and, and violence against women. And what I got from that session was so shocking to me because every single one of those women that day, at that moment, realized that they had been raped since, you know, they were at whatever age and point in their life. And, and so the thing is about awareness. If they became aware that that was the label, but to them, they grew up for, for that to be normal. So unless we're aware that things shouldn't be the way we think they are, um, it is very difficult for us to have a point of reference to change things. Uh, so, you know, just thinking about millennials of, you know, violence against women, it is normal and it's very hard for us as women to realize or to be aware that that is the case. And unless we consciously do that, then it's very hard for us to empower ourselves and to empower other women to overcome, which doesn't mean that men are evil in themselves. It's just the way that they've grown up to think that that's normal and they have to be aware <coughs> But it's not. And that is a very hard thing to change. So th thank you. That was just really um, great information. And that, I, you're, that's a really excellent point. And I will say it links into program evaluation in important ways, right? And it's part of the reason that we get such striking underestimates, right, of this phenomena. And that is that if you ask people, you know, have you been raised? A lot of people will say, no, we definitely have been. And so there's a push um, in assessment, you know, to make it less um, of a judgment call, right? Um, and more like very clear behavioral item. Like, so did a person ever take their hand and slap you on the face, right? Is very different question to answer than have you been physically abused, right? And the, the point of reference also is that Jose Miguel was saying this morning, that you, know, you have these women who are absolutely abused mm -hmm. and used by the gangs, and yet they state that their, assist, their association with the gangs is because they feel they're more respected. That's more than yeah. that's kind of problematic. Sorry, I have a question back here, and then I'll be here. Do you think that hypothetical question is? Uh, so, gender-based violence violence against someone that was their gender and then against their norms that are and how the gender belongs to someone that we right? I mean, isn't it in that sense that gang 
in violence on the other two, um, the gender based violence against men because of the way they are taught how to use their masculinity. And if so, do you think there would be any benefit to intervention to a uh, um, male lens or the gender lens, but not towards directed towards only the towards the prevention of gender or of violence against women, but also against men in uh, violence prevention intervention? Let me take a couple more. I believe you had a question and then we can come back. So my question is fairly broad. We've been talking about violence and both uh, talked about trauma and the role of trauma in individual, the impact on individuals. Could you talk about the role of trauma in the society and how that is contributing or not to the violence that we went through today? And back. So sort of to uh, provide a, a man's lens about men who do uh, the violence. As a, as a gay interventionist, I, I felt uh, like I'm in healing circles because many of us, including myself, I have like we have like father issues because we were never really taught what is a man. My, I have, I grew up with four sisters, like in, in between four sisters, so my sisters had quinceaneras, like sweet, sweet sixteen, but we didn't have that. We were never we never had anything like a rites of passage. We never had any kind of instruction like like Jewish folks they have for mitzvahs. You know, Mexicans, Latin Americans, they have the quinceanera. What did we have? I mean, and in the gang and in the gang world, there's fathers are often locked up. Uh, so the gang shock color becomes that father image. So we're not taught well. Not to say that we shouldn't be responsible, but what are the solutions here? I I, I would only offer that. Maybe we should also have a key center for the young men as an idea. I don't know. Great. I think we're going to end with those three questions, but three really good questions, and you can uh, both respond. Okay, so thanks. Um, so, I guess related to the question about gender norms, I suppose if you commented on it a little bit, um, one thing. I think it's important to recognize, I mean, particularly to violence, but also how it intersects with gender norms, is that, you know, even though um, we can see ways <coughs> in which problematic norms cause violent behavior, there's a reason that people ascribe to those, right? Um, and it's because they are often connected with cultural access or historical kind of value, right, tradition, um, or because people gain a, a sense of esteem from those same norms, right? Like, this is how I understand, you know, being a good man and being a good woman. And it's not, um, it's not all bad. And so when we think about dismantling norms and dismantling violence, we have to recognize, you know, what it's doing for people as well as how it's harming people. Um, and so I think kind of to that point, it is really important that we think about, you know, what is a vision of masculinity that is, um, that is culturally valid, but also nonviolent, right? And how do we kind of foster that for young boys and men? Um, and I do think that that is a really important question to ask um, in these interventions. I see trauma, social trauma. Uh, there is a whole movement called Cultura de Paz, Culture of Peace, which tries to instill values in people that are congenial to living together. Uh, <coughs> Greater access to sexual reproductive services to women, for example, that can contribute to the culture of peace. A greater identification of victims when they seek medical service. Uh, the home visits in poor neighborhoods to mothers should have recently given birth. Uh, 
life learning programs that address the dangers of binary lifestyles. The programs that are in jail and what are they called? Expressive calls and fears because the fears of God in their heart that doesn't work. And also <coughs> info uh, programs that reduce the consumption of alcohol and drugs. Because a bunch of things that are, are very much associated with the production of violence. Do you want to say anything about the other questions or? Okay, well, thanks everybody. Um, we're a little over time, um, but our next session needs to start exactly at five o'clock in the auditorium. It's in the other room over here. So we have about a 20 minute break. Um, and, but then we would like everybody to be in the auditorium and seated at five o'clock, please. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon.